talk about the providence of God. One of our pastors felt that God had spoke to him about two years ago and told him to leave the church in the hands of his assistant and to take his wife, Natasha, and three daughters out and live in Poland. And we thought, you've lost the plot, mate. <laughs> we thought, you're leaving your post. But he's now set up in the Polish city of Katowice. So forgive me if I don't pronounce that right. Is that pretty good? Okay. And uh, he's 500 kilometers from the border. And so I phoned him. His name's Volodya Nagula. I phoned him and I said, what are you guys doing? Uh, what, what plans do you have? I wanted to see if he was okay. So he's fine. But he said, Rob, and I said to him, I said, Dla nas Balshoi Vazbozhnost. See, Jazz. I said, for us right now, there's a huge opportunity to share the gospel with humanitarian aid. So he said, uh, he's, he was working right now, but he says, we've been talking about it with other Protestant churches in Katowice. So they're thinking about how they can use humanitarian aid uh, taken out to the border uh, and using that humanitarian aid uh, in the midst of a war to win souls for Christ in the middle of another war, a spiritual war. Amen. So that's a conversation I'm going to have with him this week. So the other thing is I, I had a phone, a phone call from, some of you would remember him, Pastor Clement. You remember Clement from uh, Slovenia. Clement has three churches in Slovenia. He's a younger guy than me. He's about a foot and a half taller. We make it some duo when we're preaching together. He's about up here and there I am down here. <clears throat> I said to him, can't you get a, a smaller interpreter? Because he was interpreting for me. But uh, Clement, he's one of these guys, if he's going to do something, he will do it. And uh, he says... He said to me, Rob, he says, uh, we could get two. He actually texted me and he says, um, what, how can we be helping Ukraine? So I wrote back a, a, a word with four capital letters and it was P-R-A-Y. He said, we are. What else can we do? So I said, well, I says, I'm keeping my eye on the border. There's nine points there in the, the Polish border where we can cross over, where people are coming in. I says, let's sit tight and see how that's working out, because there's five nations, three nations, border uh, the Ukraine. So we're going to keep an eye on it. He's in Slovenia. He'd go through Slovakia, probably up through Austria, and up to the border that way. So um, I'll keep you posted, all right? But uh, there is a tremendous opportunity here uh, to share the Word of God and offer help to these people. Amen? So praise God. Um, Mr. Pina, just unbelievable watching that. I have to, wow. Which brings me into my message anyway. I want to I talk about the church triumphant. Um, I never thought that that word, for those of you that are um, the visitors here this morning, about just over a month ago, my wife had to take me into accident and emergency. Uh, I won't go into the detail, but basically I, I couldn't pass water. Like, that doesn't mean I couldn't walk past the river or up the, the seaside, okay? But I, I thought, what's going on here? I never had an issue before. All of a sudden, for two hours, uh, and I'm feeling like I'm going to burst. You ever, said, you ever said to yourself, I feel like I'm bursting? Wow, I was feeling like I was bursting. So Julie took me into A&E, and I was in agony in A&E. And I stuck this catheter in there, and I, I wasn't going to go there, okay? But... <laughs> It's part of the story. It's, it's, it's part of the story. And, I, and it, nothing happened. It, no, nothing, nothing. I got no relief at all. And then he just walked off the doctor. He says, he says I'm, I'm, check, I'm, I'm going off in 10 minutes. I'm going home. And he just left me there and nothing had happened. And, and I was in such pain. But just like God spoke to Abby this morning, he gave me a rhema from the Logos. He gave me a quickened part of the scriptures from the, the Bible. And even as God gave you Exodus, Deuteronomy 20 this morning, he gave me 2 Corinthians um, chapter 2, verse 13. And, and it didn't go through my head. I, I, it just passed through my spirit. And it says this. I wonder if we could project that first scripture, John. He only spoke to me the first part. He says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit said to me. And so there I am in agony, and that scripture's just come to my spirit. <laughs> so through gritted teeth, <laughs> through gritted teeth, I, I affirmed that scripture, I confessed that scripture. Thanks be to God, who always, 
oh, causes us or leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. The funny thing was, though, I, I remember thinking immediately, I thought, I could die here and that scripture would still be true. <laughs> because what we, what we triumph over is death, hell, and the grave. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, this could go two ways. And I kind of thought, it was a bit like Paul where he said to the Philippians, I'm in a strait betwixt two, whether to hang around here or go off and be with Jesus, which is far, far better. But I thought, well, you know, to go off and be with Jesus is far from the worst case scenario. That's, it's easy to go as a Christian. Amen. There, there's, there's no need to fear death. But I thought, well, I'm 62. What does it matter if I kind of check in a bit early? <laughs> and then I thought about Julie and I thought about you guys and I thought about a whole bunch of stuff. And I, I thought, well, well, it's a bit ambiguous, the interpretation. And, you know, it's a bit ambiguous the way it could work out, not the interpretation, but the way it would work out. So I thought, Lord, I'm happy both ways. And in the end, I just kept confessing that scripture over and over and over again. And, and over the last month, I've got better. And I'm almost all the way there now. Anyway, I thought that would be the end of it, that I wouldn't need that scripture. And then Wednesday, Russia invades the Ukraine. And I end up with one of the, the, the greatest roller coaster uh, emotionally uh, that I've been on for uh, much greater than when I was crook. Uh, that's a Nazism for sick. Um, much, much, much more. It's just, it's brought me to tears. It's brought me to praise. It's brought me to thanksgiving. But somehow in the middle of that, you know, that word God gave me has sustained me over these last few days as I've had to cope with this and in in the responsibility I have to help these people. And it's so easy to help from the outside. Do you hear what I'm saying? And everything I say, I, everything I text, the, the scriptures, I think, well, you know, there's a little voice saying, yeah, it's all right for you. But they do so appreciate it. Our prayers, amen, out there. They so appreciate us praying. I wrote to Ross Abraham, who's the president of our movement, INC, International Network of Churches, uh, and I, I wrote him a report, and he circulated it all the way through INC. So praise God, we got the whole movement praying for him. But I, I do want to pray for um, the Ukraine, and I, I want you to pray for uh, Lucy's husband, Dima, who's Ukrainian, who's part of this church. And I, I met a lady this morning who her... She's been over from uh, Canada. He had moved back to England, and her pastor's wife is Ukrainian. So there's a lot of us got connections with the Ukrainian people. So I wonder if we could stand this morning, and uh, let's pray for the Ukraine. Let's pray for our brothers and sisters. Who do you know? Who do you know? Maybe all you know is those people on that screen. But Heavenly Father... We lift up our brothers and sisters all over the Ukraine. All the hundreds of churches that I've been in over there. All the ones that over decades have been very near and dear to me. Father, we lift them up to you. And we thank you for the faith that we have seen. We thank you in the midst of a severe trial that, my God, they are still giving you the praise. They're still in faith. They're still in the midst of it. Being thankful for your goodness, Lord. And Father, we pray that you would cover them. Even the Psalm 91 speaks about you would cover them with your wings, Lord. And that you would protect them. And you would keep them in that secret place of the Most High, whose power no foe can withstand. We pray for every Christian in the Ukraine right now. That, Lord, that you would gather them that you would draw them to that place of security, that place of safety. You tell us that when our hearts are overwhelmed, you lead us to the rock that is higher than I. Lord Jesus, you are our rock in the midst of the storm. And we pray that everyone's feet would be square on that rock. We pray, Lord, that their faith, according to the book of Hebrews, their faith would be that anchor, that anchor of hope in the midst of the storm. And Father, we pray into the big picture. Lord Jesus, Revelation chapter 1 tells us that you are the prince of the rulers of the earth. And we pray this morning, Lord, that you rule over Vladimir Putin. That you rule over President Zelensky. We pray that you rule over Boris Johnson. That you rule over Joe Biden. That you rule over President Macron. 
that you rule over every Western leader, my God. And we pray even as you caused the chariot wheels of the Egyptians when they tried to follow your people across the Red Sea, that you intervened directly and caused those chariot wheels to drive very heavy. And we pray, Lord, that you would cause this Russian invasion to slow right down, that it would be frustrated, that you would come in on behalf of the Ukraine, and Lord, that you would humble this tyrant in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen Amen. and amen. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. So we get... Yeah, it's okay. Praise God. <laughs> I've been praying that. I've been praying that. Jesus, slow down the chariots. Slow down the tanks. Slow them all down. I think, I think, I think Vladimir Putin has miscalculated. He certainly miscalculated the courage and the bravery of Zelensky. And he's miscalculated the bravery and the courage of the Ukrainian soldiers and the people. Amen. I was also very interested to see Boris Johnson speaking Russian, though. Ukrainian, actually. Uh, I thought he did. He didn't do a bad job in his pronunciation. But let's pray that Boris Johnson uh, will stick with his stated purpose is to look after the Ukraine, even if we can't help them militarily with boots on the ground. So I've told you that little testimony about how God gave me that, that scripture. Thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ. Do you know, as Abby's already demonstrated this morning at Exodus 20, there's a battle going on all the time. Exodus, sorry, Ephesians 6 tells us, 12 through 17, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the spiritual realm. Those dark forces, which I'm going to be speaking a little bit later on, how Christ has completely defeated them. And um, the, 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 the thing is, it's like we... As God's people need to know how to defend ourselves. And thank God that Abby this morning knew how, not just to defend herself with the armor of God, yet yeah, most of it's defensive, but she knew how to take the sword of the Spirit. And in the Greek, it means the sword that the Spirit wields. And how does he wield it? How did she wield it? It takes two together. You look, at the, you look into the Greek of that verse, it's talking about two together. It's about the Holy Spirit taking that little part of the Logos, the Logos is the whole mind of God. Amen. It's, it's the, the Logos is the entire Bible. If, if God was to give you a download of the whole Bible all at once, quicken the whole thing, your mind would just go... Pfft. But what God does in each and every situation where we have a challenge or we believe in God for somebody or whatever else, He will, he will quicken Sometimes a scripture, sometimes it's a couple of words, sometimes a, a whole psalm, and, and God will quicken that. And all of a sudden you find yourself, whoa, God spoke to me. Yeah. And it's, what do you do at that point? It's, number one, is recognize the Holy Spirit has just given you the sword. Yeah. It's the sword that the Spirit wields. He's the one that has quickened it to you, and he's the one that when you launch it out of your mouth in faith, the anointing and the power of God comes on it to slice and dice the realm of the Spirit. Amen? And where he has been intimidating, where he's been threatening, where he's been undermining your confidence, as you speak that word out, what happened? The confidence came. The strength of God came. And you just grew a mile in the realm of the Spirit, girl. You did a phenomenal job this morning. You did a wonderful job this morning. So when God spoke that little ambiguous scripture to me, <laughs> it either meant I was going to triumph over death, hell, and a grave and pass out of this world and then the next, which is okay. I hear Christians sometimes talking about, I hear Christians sometimes talking about death in terms, well, the worst case scenario. So the worst case scenario for you is to go and meet Jesus. Where the Bible says to go and be with Jesus, it's far, far better than life continued down here. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
You can almost hear the disappointment in Paul's voice at that point. And Philippians says, but I guess I've got to hang around with you blokes. <laughs> but let's, obviously I spent a lot of time praying the scripture, going into it. I've, I have gone through three commentaries just to dig every bit of truth out of this because this is the scripture I'm traveling on. You know, this, the last month, this is what has got me through my bladder problems. <laughs> my water work problems. I'm okay now. Somebody asked me this morning, are you still wearing that thing? <laughs> Thank goodness I'm not. <laughs> but I need to extract every bit of truth out of this. Because I don't know how long this thing with Ukraine is going to last. Amen. So this is what I'll be traveling on. So let's read the whole scripture, shall we? And we're going to look at a word picture. We're going to look at a metaphor that Paul the Apostle was inspired to use by the Holy Spirit. And he uses it three different ways. I learned this about when I was six months old in the Lord at about 1985, listening to yet another Derek Prince audio cassette tape. For those of you that don't know what an audio cassette cassette tape is, I would, who could I, no, I won't, I better not mention anybody that, we'll just keep going, shall we? Just Google it. Thank you, Annabella. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I feel better. Okay. So let's read the whole scripture, shall we? Let's, let's go. But thanks be to God who always, you get that? Say it after me. Always. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Now, this is the word we're going to unpack. Always leads us in triumph in Christ. Everybody say triumph. And through us spreads and makes evident everywhere the sweet fragrance of the knowledge of him. What You might say, what has that got to do with a triumph? We're coming to that. They're vitally connected. Verse 15, for we, the church, we God's people, for we are the sweet fragrance of Christ, which ascends to God, discernible both among those who are being saved, yeah, and among those who are perishing. To the latter one, an aroma from death to death, a fatal offensive odor, as the Amplified says, but to the other, an aroma from life to life, a vital fragrance, living and fresh. And who is adequate and sufficiently qualified for these things? So what did Paul mean when he talks about a triumph, God always leading us in triumph in Christ? Well, As Dr. Derek Prince pointed out in that audio cassette tape, I heard him say this, and it's still going on in my mind. I can hear his his voice. He says, a triumph was not the winning of a victory. It was the celebration of a victory already won. Okay? So let's think about that again. A triumph was not the winning of the victory. It was the celebration of a victory already already won, sometimes weeks and months before in the context of the Roman Empire. So a triumph in Roman times in which the Apostle Paul lived was not the winning of a victory, but the celebration of a victory already won. So when a Roman general had been conspicuously victorious, particularly if it had been overseas, not just kind of quenching a rebellion uh, within the confines of the Roman Empire, if he'd taken another province from another king, what they would do is the Senate of Rome would grant him a triumph. In other words, a celebration of the victory. Are you with me? Now, I want to show you exactly what it looked like because it will bring the whole metaphor, the whole word picture to life. So I've got four images here that I got off Google Images, okay? So let's present the first one. Okay, I've got my trusty little thingo here. Okay, do so you see, this is, you can see up here, this one is Vespasian's. Uh, this is his triumph 
the general Vespasian. And uh, maybe you've been to Rome and you, you have seen these uh, arches of triumph. So here you can see that there's the general. There's the really conspicuously successful general. You see him there? All right. Do you see the horses? So he was in a chariot with four horses. So let's keep that one up there, guys. And you can see all the way behind him this long procession. You see it there? All right. And here's all the people looking on. Now, let's go to the, the next one, if we could, John. Right. Now, this one, oh, sorry, I didn't realize this person didn't have too many clothes on. <laughs> I do think it's a male. I'm, it's, I'm not entirely sure. But what, <laughs> my apologies if I've offended anybody. But um, I want you to have a look at this. I want you to have a look at this picture. You see the same four horses? Okay. You can see the, the general there. But what I want you to notice particularly here, because it has a lot of bearing on the second part of that verse about us being a fragrance. Yeah? This is, a, this is an incense bearer here. You'll see he's holding up an, a, a, a censer. And uh, let me just, uh, that's good. All right, maybe we can go to number three, number four, John. Okay, just a couple more to help you. All right, you see the, the same thing. They would sometimes put a wreath on the general. Sometimes they'd paint his face red as well. Let's go to the next one. Here it is again. Sometimes they would even have evidences of the culture in this long procession, things like elephants, etc., etc. I wonder if we could go back, John, uh, to the second photograph. Photograph? <laughs> second photograph. Yeah, right. So let me just tell you the details of this triumph. Now, for those of you that know the Scriptures, okay, so you've got the Colossians 2.15 reference, and you've got this reference. In the King James Bible, there are two main references to the triumph. So let me just tell you a bit about this incredible celebration, this incredible procession all the way through the streets of Rome. So the general would be clothed in a purple toga, purple being the richest color you could get in those days, placed in a chariot driven by four white horses. Number two, the procession behind him would extend for hundreds of meters, hundreds of yards, and it could take an entire day to make its way through the streets of Rome. In the procession, sometimes before him, some, usually after him, sometimes in the procession, behind the general and his, his chariot with his four white horses, there would be a long line behind him comprised of conquered, the conquered king, yeah, the conquered generals and the captains and the sergeants and all the way down to the foot soldiers and they were all stripped naked sometimes with nothing on at all, and totally in chains and manacles, obviously defeated. You hear what I'm saying? They are, they all, it's not the King James Bible. I think it's the original Amplified. It talks about they, the, the principalities have been stripped and spoiled. So they were all stripped and spoiled. Behind them, there would be cartload after cartload after cartload of the spoils of war. When they invaded an exotic place, as I said, you would see elephants and peacocks and lions and tigers. Just a demonstration of total and absolute victory. Amen? Now, this, is, this, one, this has a bearing, this, this next little point I want to make. As the procession made its way along, there would be priests alongside carrying censers and bowls of incense. So, as the procession made its way through the streets of Rome, there would be a cloud of incense all the way through. Remember what he said about we are that fragrance of God, okay? And it went up in clouds over the procession and the crowds watching that procession. Now, at various points along the way of this procession, the procession would halt and there would be fresh incense put in the censers. And the thing is, the prisoners at that point, knew there was something very serious about to happen. Because at that point, some of the prisoners would be taken aside and slain. They'd be taken aside and killed. So they associated this cloud of incense with either, I'm going to live or I'm going to die. Are you with me? Are you starting to get some revelation, some light on what that 
scripture means. Let's go back to that scripture, John, if we can. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us spreads and makes evident everywhere the sweet fragrance of the knowledge of Him. See, you're a Christian. God lives in you. Amen. And it says, for we are that sweet fragrance of Christ which ascends to God, discernible both among those who are being saved, those people you're praying for, those people you're witnessing to. Hello? And if you live a consistent, holy, generous, loving your neighbor kind of life, hello, and you're bold enough to present the message here and there, you live that kind of life amongst the people you work with and your neighbors, friend, there's incense coming out of you. You are that fragrance. And for the ones that you've been praying for, your life is a confirmation. You, you are a fragrance of life unto life. You've got the message of life, of eternal life that you share with people. And then beyond that, your life is confirmation of that. You live it because they haven't met anybody like you before. Do you hear what I'm saying? To be in that place, you have to continually keep short accounts with God. Don't have any guilt in your conscience. Make sure you confess your sins as soon as they happen. That you're always dwelling in that smile of God, that presence of God. Hello? And you get your nose in the Word of God. You're praying so that God can use you at any one given time. And, be, and as you're praying in the Spirit, it's like, man, you just keep that, that life, that vibrancy. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? People, yeah, people ought to regularly be saying to you, man, what kind of energy do you have? You know, people so familiar with new age kind of terms and they don't know, they don't know what to say. So I say, man, you know how many times I said that to us? It's like, man, you, you've got energy. What, what's that energy you got? I says, that energy ain't energy. That is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I, I'm born again, man. That's, that's God in me that you're feeling. Amen. And as we live those consistent kind of lives, not up and down and up and down and panic and faith, that is no witness whatsoever. You're doing no better than anybody else in the world. We have got it for the glory of God to live higher than that. Amen. We need to be in that place consistently where we really are the fragrance of God. Rather than being the fragrance one day and saying, what's that bad smell of depression or whatever else other? And I know which some of us are working stuff through, but we really need to get to that place, amen, and believe God wants us to get to that place. Are you with me? Yeah. Praise God, because we're rapidly running out of time and I've got half this message done. So let's, let me share with you how, the, the, we'll see if we get there in the end. I might, I might extend this next week. But, the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to use this metaphor, this word picture of the triumph, three different ways. John, can we go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 15? Colossians 2, verse 15. It says this, speaking of Jesus Christ, when he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities. Other versions will talk about powers and principalities. What it means is, as it goes on to say, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us. The old Amplified will talk about those powers and principalities that were ranged against us. It says, this, he made a public example of them. <laughs> Where? <laughs> How? He says he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession. He made a public example of them, having triumphed over them in the cross. You see, these powers and principalities, these dark forces, they're the ones that want to damn every soul to hell where they're going to be spending eternity. And the only thing they have on us as human beings is the fact that because of original sin, we're all sinners. We're all guilty before God. We've all broken God's commandments. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the wonder of it all is that God's free gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And, you know, 
up until Christ came, every human being was guilty before God. God had a system, a sacrificial system for his people of the Old Testament, Old Testament Israel. And it was all about the blood of bulls and goats and sacrifices and that never had the power to deal with their sin permanently. But then Jesus came as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice of God, our peace offering. And when he died on that cross, he carried every sin of every body that had ever been committed and ever would be. The Bible says that the devil had known what he was doing. He would never have crucified Jesus Christ because the devil didn't recognize that as he was crucifying him, you know, by whipping up the crowd and, and everything that transpired there, as the Romans nailed him to that cross and Jesus died, that devil did not know that the blood that trickled down was the sacrificial blood that would purchase our souls. And if we, amen. And if we, for everyone, for anyone that believes in Jesus Christ, believe in who he was, God in human flesh, that believe in his miraculous virgin birth, that believe, very importantly, in his sinless life. He never sinned. He had to be innocent as he was put to death. Do you hear what I'm saying? He died as a righteous man. And the wonderful thing is, as he was, as he was crucified, but raised from the dead, there was no devil, principality, power in hell could hold him down. Not one of them could hold him down. And Jesus rose from the dead for our justification. So when anybody puts their trust in God and say, Father, I believe in the Lord Jesus. Lord, I believe the gospel. Lord, I want to go to heaven. Lord, I, I believe. Please forgive me. In that instant of time, God says, justified. You're justified. And the only thing those powers and principalities had on us, the only thing was we were guilty. And so when God says not guilty, Jesus takes control of your life and the devil loses control. Amen. He's totally lost you. <laughs> and Jesus has redeemed you. Christ has purchased you. Amen. So God has totally stripped and spoiled every principality, every power. That's why I could pray before Jesus as the prince of the rulers of the earth. Rule over Putin and rule over his puppet master. Amen. So this is a wonderful picture of Jesus, even metaphorically speaking, that he, 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 he led this triumphal procession. But friend, maybe it wasn't met a metaphor. Maybe he wasn't speaking metaphorically. Maybe Jesus really did lead this procession in the realm of the spirit with a devil like this and change behind him. <laughs> Why do I, I tend to lean towards this position because there is a wonderful scripture in Judges 5, I think, 12, where it says this. And also, Ephesians 4, 8. This is why there's a lot of weight in this. Ephesians 4, 8, quoting Psalm 68. And the only other time you will read this phrase I'm about to tell you is when the singers in the book of Judges, when Deborah, any Deborah isn't here, when Deborah and Barak won an incredible victory. And in the song, in the book of Judges, it says, Arise, Deborah, arise, Barak, and lead captivity captive. In other words, lead your captives captive in a procession, in a victory procession. This is predates the Roman triumph, but friend, this was part and parcel of warfare back then. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. So, Paul, the apostle Paul picks this up in Ephesians 4.8. I want to look at it. Speaking of Jesus... Quoting Isaiah 68, there's a messianic psalm. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, that's Jesus, amen, ascending on high. It says, he led captivity captive. Whoa. So maybe Jesus really did lead these devils, these principalities and powers in some kind of victory procession. Maybe. 
Maybe it's just a metaphor. I don't know. But, you, you know, you might be wondering, in terms of leading captivity captive, where do we fit in this? Where are we in this triumphal procession? <laughs> you see, he paints this picture of us in this triumphal procession as willing POWs. Yeah? He spoiled the devil. He, he completely conquered the devil. And we are the spoils of that war. Okay? So, wow. We're willing captives. We are willingly captivated by Jesus. Amen? The devil used to control us, but now Jesus has captured us. Willingly. We've, we've been willing about that. And I remember thinking, Lord, in the early days when I was a Christian, Lord, where do we fit in that? And I remember in a flash, I saw this picture. And I kind of was somewhere in the procession, somewhere back there, just thanking, Jesus got me. But then the Lord showed me something. And he showed me me beside him in a chariot. <laughs> hey, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, turn around and give him a kick. <laughs> kick the devil, son. Amen. And that's the way I've always seen it. Christ leads me in triumph in Christ Jesus. I'm thinking, Jesus, yeah, you lead me in triumph. I'm a POW of yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for captivating my heart. Thank you for winning the war. I'm a glad POW of yours. Amen. And he leads me in triumph, always leads me in triumph in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're in Christ Jesus if you're a Christian, you're in Christ Jesus. So every minute of every day, you are being led in a triumphal procession. If we could only believe that. So when stuff happens, when challenges come, whether it is feeling a bit anxious or you wake up to a war, friend, Thanks be unto God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're way over time. We're willing captives. Let me just finish this because, do you remember we pointed out the incense bearers? Who would stop every now and again and offer up sacrifice to the Roman gods. And at the same time, some of those prisoners in that procession would be taken aside and killed, like sacrificed to those gods. Friend, you and I are that fragrance of God. But if there's one thing that incense needs, is enough heat to burn. Enough heat for that incense to start smoking. Amen? Consistently. I try, to, I try to, the best I can to stick close to Jesus so that the neighbors that I see day by day, day after day, that they see a consistency in my life so that when they come to my place for Christmas, as they did at Christmas, and they don't want to know about the Bible, and, but they're on their way. But my... My message from my life is consistent. So when I share about life in Jesus and eternal death, my life is confirmation that this is true. This gospel message is true. Amen. So let's be that fragrance. Let, let's not be somehow the fragrance one day and then a foul smell of selfishness and self-centeredness and woe is me the next. Hello? Hello? Let's be that company of people that is a cloud of incense. First of all, unto God. Because we're living sacrifices unto God. Because our lives are on the altar. What did Paul say in Romans 12? He says, I beg you, brethren. I beg you, brethren. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and acceptable unto God. Which is your reasonable service. So as we live that cross life. As we pick up our cross each day and deny stinky self, stinky self-will, stinky self-determination, stinky self-reliance, 
and we walk in the truth of our baptism, the old man is dead and buried with him. Amen. And we're raised to new life. Amen. And that life flows out of Christ in us. Then, as we walk our everyday lives, that cloud of incense is just there, somehow confirming who we are, the message of who Christ is and who he is in us. Amen? Let's stand and let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. So be encouraged, guys. Be encouraged. I pray you all get Ramus out of the Logos continually. Sometimes you just live on it for a week. Sometimes just a moment to get you through a moment. But the wonderful thing about every rhema you get is it sits with you. It, it kind of becomes part of your filing system. It's internalized. Amen? So, Father God, we thank you that you still speak to your people. We thank you, Lord, for this rhema that you shared with me that last month that got me through that very difficult time physically and is now getting me through a very difficult time emotionally. I thank you for the truth of it, that we can say, thanks be unto God who always leads us in triumph, in a celebration of a victory already won. Lord, you lead us in celebration. Help us to join you. Help us to join the celebration. Help us to count it all joy when we encounter various trials of different sorts. Help us, Lord, to align our thinking, to align our faith with the truth of this. That we are there with you in your chariot, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. And while we are still alive, that we are triumphant, Lord, by faith through every circumstance. No wonder the Apostle Paul said in all of these things, height and depth and breadth. What did he talk about? Romans 8 there. Things threatening, things impending, powers and principalities, death. He said, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And he says, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. So even as Paul went through all of that stuff and he says, we're like sheep to the slaughter. It seems that we're almost in the point of death so many times. But he said, in all of this, we are more than conquerors. And how can we be more than a conqueror? Either you conquered or you didn't. The way you're more than a conqueror, friend, is to realize that you are in a continual triumphal procession celebrating a victory already won. That's what it is to be more than a conqueror. And Father, we give you the praise and we give you the thanks as we walk out of here that nothing can separate us from the love of God, nothing at all. And in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Let's give him a clap. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise, some applause. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.